Hello. Welcome back to the Space Golog. We're doing part two of three of What If Earth Was in Star Wars. Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, everyone else part of my team with a chance to win a lightsaber in the next giveaway. Watch the end of the video, I'll tell you exactly how you can win. Our story continues in the Copernican system. Since the age of the Old Republic, the people of Earth took advantage of the resources present in their star system. They made several contracts with businesses within the Republic. After a thousand years of growth, the contracts ended, and the people of the Copernican system moved in and replaced all the facets of industry. The Tabana gas refineries on Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter would be replaced with higher functioning refineries. On the other hand, the mining operations across the multitude of planets and asteroid belts from Earth to the Kuiper Belt would be replaced as well. As Earth's tech caught up with the rest of the galaxy, their own starships would be their own means of transport from Earth to all these industrial locations. Of course, the other energy industrial facilities on Mercury and Venus would provide renewable power for Earth. The planet itself saw much change. Since the first intermediate period in Egypt and the Shai'i dynasty in China, Earth transformed into an advanced society. While in Egypt they hadn't begun the period of pyramid building, they never truly would. Truthfully, once the Republic returned, Earth's major civilizations would converge in one major area. Eurasia would become the site of the largest sectors of human population. The Mediterranean, the Nile River, and the Yellow River would host an array of massive cities. Skyscrapers would tower into the skies, and architecture would resemble the elegance and beauty of Coruscant, while maintaining the luscious, natural beauty of Alderaan. Earth's people, ever since the invasion of the Sith, were in tight unison. Well, rather they came together because of the Jedi when they first arrived, because the humans had no real reason to challenge each other, and they found their communications with other civilizations to be useful for themselves, and so they united. Truthfully, the people of Earth had no long-standing competitions. There were instances of decay between neighboring civilizations, but once the Jedi arrived and left Thebes and Shandals, the people of Earth decided to unite in case the Jedi or the Sith returned. When the Republic did eventually come back, the people of Earth were skeptical, but with the Council of Thebes, as it was referred to at the time, united, they decided to make an accord with the Republic. The Council of Thebes became known as the Council of Earth. Sprawling cities emerged from the Italian peninsula to Yemen, Romania, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, down the Nile to Heraclopolis, and, of course, the massive capital city of Earth in Zenzao. The common theme between all these cities was their location near a body of water. Whether it be the Nile, Mediterranean, Arabian Sea, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, or of course the Yellow River. Senators from Earth were a bit of a unique bunch. Always a cast of diverse faces, but they all shared the common interest of love for planet Earth. The technology of Earth developed into remarkable stuff and it would only be a matter of time until the people of the Copernican system set themselves up for longevity in the galaxy. Above Earth was a large structure, and they would also build next to it the first space station with battle platforms. Being that the Copernican system was in the mid-rim, they were susceptible to attacks from pirates, especially since Earth began donning the name of Alderaan of the mid-rim. Earth had an established militia fleet because of the value the Copernican system annually created. Earth had a large trading deal with the Republic, and because of all the natural resources in the Copernican system, the people of Earth thrived off the credits and used all of their earnings on better living for the people of the planet and better facilities across the system. As for the governing of Earth, it was rather democratic, surprisingly. Considering the mix of governing bodies at the time the Jedi landed, the people of Earth had little issues reforming from the feudal system and removing monarchs from power. Being that the emperors of the Shi'i dynasty were ousted, after people noted the functionality of the Egyptians in the first intermediate period without pharaohs or monarchs. It was a dark time for Earth, because they existed in a realm of communication, but outside that communication, they had little contact with each other. They couldn't access each other. Their religious situation was also extremely different. The Egyptians and the Chinese were polytheistic. The people of Earth kept these similar values, but once the Jedi came to Earth, for the children of the Force, the people of Earth split into two separate religions. The first religion was the people of the Force. Generally, this religion existed in the Mediterranean and the Mile River area, while the other religion, being simply a polytheistic culmination of cultures, would simply exist in the Black Sea, Arabian Sea, and Yellow River area. As Earth pushed forward into the future, they would see the galaxy outside them greatly change. While the Egyptians rid themselves of the slaves they had during the first intermediate period, it was obvious others in the galaxy still harbored slaves. 
the people of the Copernican system didn't falter into barbaric habits or societal traits. While the Eurasian continent was filled with populous cities, there were groups of civilizations in the Americas. The people of the Karo Supper in Peru were the only large formidable group of civilized humans that the Jedi interacted with in the Old Republic. Truthfully, there were thousands of isolated tribes throughout the Americas, and the people of Earth discovered them, but they let them be. There was no real reason to impede on their territory, and they allowed them to function in their own right. Many believed that these tribes were worshippers of the Force, but no one really knew. They were greatly respected among the Council of Earth, but they too were mystified by them as well. The Council of Earth had a very distinguished close ally in the core. While they were very much so a part of the Greater Republic, they had trading partners they got along with better than the others. A couple notable partners were Kuat, Corellia, Alderaan, Anaxes, Kata Nemodia, Ringo Vinda, and Mon Calamari. The best part about being allies with all these systems was their advancements in space-related tech. Because the people of the Copernican system were late bloomers in the galaxy, their interest was in space expansion. With the amount of credits the Copernican system made, they consistently paid out heavy amounts of credits for the best supplies around the galaxy. Their relationship with Kuat and Mon Calamari was incredibly important for their star tech. The High Republic was a period of extreme growth in the Copernican system. The people of Earth were able to completely explore their entire planet and have a complete understanding of every species on their planet. There hadn't been a significant war, let alone battle, since the Sith invaded during the Old Republic. Earth was thriving, and because of it being an economical powerhouse in the galaxy, it had a lot of leverage on Coruscant. The Council of Earth was very influential, and this even continued out of the High Republic era into the Age of the Galactic Republic. That Age of the Galactic Republic would be filled with tensions and once the Trade Federation began its blockade of Naboo, the Council of Earth was outraged. Naboo wasn't necessarily close to Earth in terms of relations, but it was a mid-rim system, and that meant the threat was real enough to be talked about on Earth. The people of Earth would come to the conclusion, believing that the Trade Federation would definitely do it again. While the Council of Earth had good relations with Cato Nemodia during the High Republic, the people of Earth saw an issue with the Trade Federation openly blockading the planet on Naboo. The people of Earth's closeness with the space tech-heavy star systems would begin the work on the construction of their own space stations. While the Copernican system had multiple space stations littered across the system, like an engine factory over Mars and a battle platform over Earth, the Council decided that they would work more towards more defense platforms around Earth, specifically, and on top of that, an automated defense fleet, using technology that they had from the Trade Federation. During the High Republic, the Council of Earth worked closely with the Trade Federation, meaning Earth had its own Lucrehulks, centuries old, but still Lucrehulks. Earth had its own notable cruisers and intergalactic vessels, though most of them were luxury vehicles. Some were yachts that were bought by the uber-rich on planets like Canto Bight. Other vessels were ships that senators of the Galactic Republic used, different versions of upper-class corvettes, nothing too large but specific to Earth. With the recent issue on Naboo, the newest shipyard would be constructed around Earth's moon. Truthfully, the people of Earth had landed on the moon and could have colonized it, but decided against it. Now they would use the moon as a secret base for defending the planet of Earth. An entire fleet of AI starfighters would be built and placed there. As for the shipyard, it would lay outside of Earth's orbit, but heavily protected by a couple new battle platforms. Other planets in the Republic called these Golan Platforms, though the people of Earth built their own model, inspired heavily by the Golan Platform, but with a lot more firepower. The shipyards constructed around Earth would have the best manufacturers inside of the Mid-Rim, and they would begin to construct ships for other planets in the Mid-Rim. Basically, anyone who ordered something and couldn't afford the price of the Kuat Drive Yards, Ringo Vinda, or Mon Calamari. This added to the amount of galactic credits that the Copernican system drew in. Because of the success, the Council of Earth would construct another grouping of shipyards just beyond the asteroid belt next to Mars and build it around Jupiter. The success of the construction of these yards would be remarkable. For the next 10 years, everything would go brilliantly. The expansion of the Copernican shipyards would complete justly with the Kuat drive yards, and then war would break out. Earth, being loyal to the Republic, would side with the Republic war effort, defining their lines across the Mid-Rim as the only Republic-allied planet in a bunch of Separatist-aligned worlds. Not that there weren't Republic planets in the Mid-Rim, but they were surrounded by purely Separatist worlds. 
This, of course, was a very bad spot to be. But with support from Chancellor Palpatine, the people of Earth saw it to be a functional strategy. On top of that, the Chancellor was allowed to create a military thanks to the fill-in senator of Naboo, Jar Jar Binks, who voted on behalf of the Chancellor. Palpatine would dispatch an admiral to the Copernican system to deliver a set of blueprints for the new fighting force of the Republic, the Venator-class Star Destroyer. The order would be massive, and it would require every single shipyard bay to be open. In exchange, the Council of Earth requested that Earth be given a defense fleet to protect themselves, to which they were granted. Palpatine also decided that he would task the Copernican system with the first super-class dreadnought, titled the Pride of the Core. It would be the best kept secret here. While Dooku and the Separatists knew that the Copernican system was a strong foothold on the Mid-Rim, they would never assume a project of such magnitude to be created here. Also, being that the Copernican system was such a foothold, there was a bit of tension with the idea of actually invading the system, because it could cost them extra losses. Of course, with Palpatine controlling both sides of the war, he could avoid it, but sometimes Separatist generals got too excited with their own plans, especially someone as rambunctious as General Grievous. The Copernican system would get to work immediately on the growth of its Venator fleet, so that the Republic could have all these vessels it needed when the time came for battle. Inside the capital of Zen Zhao, people would construct a living district for the clone troopers, so that they could be moved from Kamino to Earth and be ready when the ships were finished on the shipyards. These facilities in Zen Zhao would be some of the best facilities in the entire Republic for clone troopers. It wasn't isolated from the rest of the capital city, but it would be very identifiably different and in their own location. For the clones, when they arrived, they'd have living quarters, their own academy for training, a simulation room where they could operate a Venator in real time to train for battles, and of course, a clone trooper bar. It had the likes of everything they needed, though truthfully, the Council of Earth believed this would be such a good idea that they began the construction of a Republic Academy. It would be situated in the same vicinity as a clone trooper district. While the people of Earth weren't known for warfare, or even waging war in the slightest, they were continuously trying to earn the favor of the Chancellor, and the Republic. It was hard for such a lavish system to be placed in the Mid-Rim. Not that Mid-Rim planets were bad by any means, but Earth was referred to as the Alderaan of the Mid-Rim. The people of Earth felt as if they should be treated like core citizens. They produced a hell of a lot of materials that planets around the Republic used, and truthfully, they liked the idea of being treated like they were in the core, especially being that they weren't often treated as such. Sure, tourism from the core world citizens was great, but even those from the core worlds looked down at the Mid-Rim system as a second-tier system in the greater galaxy. If the Copernican system could earn more favor with the Republic, then certainly there'd be no issue with securing bias from the rest of the galaxy. The truth is, the people of Earth worked best when they had a common goal, and when they focused on said common goal, they were nearly unstoppable. It was just simply a matter of having something to shoot for. Regardless, the facilities in Zen Zhao would be constructed quickly and the shipyards across the Copernican system would begin to mass-produce Venators. The crazy thing is, the Copernican system did what the Kuat drive yards were known for, but better. Sometimes there would be systematic flaws in ships from the Kuat drive yards, nothing too significant, but it always required an extra mechanic doing some after-release work. When ships came from Earth, they were completely finished and they had absolutely no issues. The Copernican system also pumped out vessels with higher firing rates, using some of the technology they stole from the Trade Federation. There was also an undisclosed group of people from Earth. They lived on the moon orbiting Saturn called Titan, and they worked as mercenaries for the planet of Earth. They were rarely mentioned or ever talked about, but they were ever so swift. It wasn't against the rules per se, but it also wasn't respected when people raided battlefields and collected the spoils of war. These individuals were called the Titan Scavengers. What they did, and had been doing for centuries, was loot the wreckage of skirmishes and battlefields across the galaxy, bringing all the supplies back to the secret base on Titan, and then dispersing the materials back to Earth and the rest of the facilities around the system so they could use it for whatever, whether it be ships, buildings, technology, or whatnot. Truthfully, it worked to perfection, and it cost absolutely nothing. As for the pay of these mercenaries, they didn't need any. They were employees of the Council of Earth and they were paid under the Space Institution of Earth. The Clone Wars got off to a rocky start for the Republic, while the Copernican system was able to repair the cloning facilities for those who would be manning the Venators they built, the Separatists were marching into the Mid-Rim. 
a number of planets in the Minrim were loyal to the Separatists, which made the Copernican system a troublesome area to be in. Though the defense fleet around the planet was terrific, and the new vessels that were created from the Copernican system went into war in the Mid-Rim, fighting for the Republic. The war would continue for several months. The Republic looked to be losing the fight when the Separatists would arrive outside of Earth with a massive fleet. Ironically, the fleet that would arrive was the original support fleet for the Malevolence. The fleet was still massive by every means, but the Titan Scavengers had just brought back their first recovered pieces from the Dead Moon on Antor, where the Malevolence crashed. The Scavengers found lots of parts in the EMP weapon, and believed for them to be useful. When the Separatists sent their first attack force to Earth, they were blindsided. Former Trade Federation Lucrehulks, Republic capital ships, and the AI from the moon base launched a three-way attack. Some may call this a master flank, and truly, it was a master flank. As many of the humans on Earth would call this, a reverse Unu card. The Separatists would be locked into a gridlock, and they would have nowhere to go. Once Earth's moon deployed its interdiction field, the Separatists were doomed. And the best part of all of it? was the ability to cash in on the spoils of war, of course. The defense line outside of Earth being aided by the Earth-constructed Golan platforms would be majorly successful that the Separatists wouldn't even think about coming back to the Copernican system. After nearly a year and a half of war, the pride of the Corps would be rolled off the assembly line at the Saturn drive yards. The escort fleet was already prepared and ready to meet up with it. One of the pride of the Corps was unveiled to the Republic, Chancellor Palpatine personally hailed the Copernican system as the creators of the magnificent weapon that would see the downfall of the Confederacy. Palpatine was so pleased with his Super Star Dreadnought and wanted to order another one. Palpatine, before celebrating Naboo's joining of the Republic of Centuries, would visit the Copernican system to personally thank the Council of Earth for the pride of the core. When he arrived, he found that the people of Earth had a surprise for him. They harvested the Malevolence and they worked on its technology that was left behind, and had a new line of weapons and vessels for him in the Republic. He was overwhelmingly pleased. Earth's constant drive to be the best in the Republic proved to be a useful ally to him. Palpatine awarded the Copernican system with the title Pride of the Republic. While it wasn't necessarily in the core, nor could it ever be a part of the core physically, Palpatine decided to bestow the title to the planet so that they would consistently be, as such, the Pride of the Republic. Palpatine also had a new request for them to work on, alongside of their new construction. While the Venator was a useful ship, and because of the Kuat drive yards and the shipyards at Ringo Vinda falling behind on production quotas, Palpatine requested that the Copernican system begin working on a new vessel for the future of the Republic. Wink wink. The blueprints were for a vessel that was much larger than the Venator, which meant that the Copernican system would have to expand their shipyard facilities, which was worth the price it would cost. As a second year of war whisked by, the Republic, led by General Skywalker, would push the Separatists out of the Mid-Rim, and the Outer Rim sieges would begin. The galaxy was on edge, waiting for the news that would come in, next as the Jedi Generals led their men on the battlefronts. Just as the Copernican system finished up its first wing of five Republic Star Destroyers, Coruscant was invaded. Earth would deploy the new vessels with their crews to assist at the Battle of Coruscant. The first day in the field for the Star Destroyers would be successful. To the people of Earth, it was yet another victory in their books, another success. A couple days later, everything would change. The Jedi Master and Apprentice stationed on Earth would be executed for committing treason. Truthfully, the Council of Earth was outraged. How could the Jedi betray the Republic? It wouldn't be long until a longtime friend of the Copernican system would crown himself Emperor of the Galactic Empire, and the people of Earth would completely support it. Across the capital of Zen Zhao, the people would begin to put up signs telling all citizens to report Jedi if they were found. These signs would go up across the multitude of cities across Earth. One may assume this was concerning for the people on the Western Hemisphere of Eurasia that religiously believed in the Force, but truthfully, they believed in the Force, not the Jedi, nor were they loyal to the Jedi by any means. The people of Earth were extremely loyal to the Republic, newly crowned Empire. The Council of Earth would reach out to the Emperor and ask if there was anything in particular that they could do. The Emperor reported that after Tarkin went to Kamino to inform the Kaminoans of the changes to the cloning facilities, that he would be arriving in the Copernican system with 
a whole new boat of requests the Emperor had planned for them. The Emperor would tell them that he was entirely grateful for their loyalty, and look forward to what they would create in the coming years under the Empire. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of part two of three of our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan Pimp, Daddy Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo, Mad Men, Stu's, Anakin 003, Spencer Bird, and Flynn Ben Seats for supporting the channel. Hit down the likes of the video. I know it's coming next, but it is. If you want to see it, I don't know. I read all the comments, but I don't cross over. Check out the Twitch community Discord and Patreon. Support in other ways. For a free lights, if we go down below, there's a lock. You, there's a dock. You click on the dock. You write your name on the dock. Don't. That's what the duck. I know who's doing it. I see you. You're not going to want a lightsaber, but you will want a lightsaber if you subscribe and do the thing and don't mess with the duck. Simple enough, simple enough. Cool. Hit that subscribe button. I'm moving away in three weeks, so smash that subscribe button. I want to give those lightsabers away before I move. 50,000 subscribers is the goal. Let's talk about our story for part two real quick. I just want to cover a little bit basis for the creativity of my mind and where I'm kind of thinking about this. Um, so yeah, that happened. You didn't see that coming, did you? Yeah, that was an Uno reverse card, wasn't it? Yeah, I did that. I, I don't have any shame in doing that. Earth is now a part of the Empire. Come at me, bro. Why? <laughs> because I don't want them to be part of, of the Rebellion. You know how interesting it's me being able to play the Empire side in the next story? I have so many ideas, and I'm so excited, and nothing you can say is going to change my mind, because I have got so many ideas for the Empire, and what this is going to do for the Empire. Now, is Earth a little overpowered? Maybe just a little bit. It is. We love it, though. We love it. Okay, we do. It's 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 a powerhouse. What can we say? We have we have so many cool resources here. How can it not be a powerhouse? And you know, there is some truth layered into what I'm saying in the story. It's like when people. This is literally like this. I, I'm saying this for for a purpose, right? I I do enforce that I have a message in every video that you can take home with you, right? There's a very enforced message in every video that you have something to, to earn from it, something to learn from it, something to, to, to take home with you. And the message from this is people do really good when they come together. We just do. Like, it's amazing. It's beautiful. When people come together, we do incredible things. Even if it's not for the right reasons, we do we do come together and we do incredible things. Uh, the space program is the one that comes to mind at the moment. Um, yeah, we were kind of doing a whole rivalry thing with you know people, but like when we come together to do something, when we focus on one thing, we do it really good, and that's the point. This Earth isn't our Earth. This Earth, and that's a point of that me avoiding that too. Point of me avoiding modern Earth is because I don't want to get into politics. I don't. I want to get into moral ideas. I want to get into constructive ideas. I want to get into large picture things. I don't want to get into this side versus this side, right? That's why I avoided modern Earth, okay? That's the entire reason why I avoided it, because there's going to be someone from that side and be like, no, you're bad, and the other person will be like, no, you're bad, and I'll be like, what, I don't want that here. This is Star Wars. We're talking about Star Wars, and <sighs> the bigger concept is that the Earth in this Star Wars universe, the Earth in this universe, has moved past what we already are going through, right? This Earth has, has moved on to greater ideas, has moved on to the idea that there's something greater out there beyond just fighting with each other. And, and the fact that people can work together and create something beautiful, that's so much more uplifting than, hey, we have AK-47s and you have blasters. Let's have fun with that. No, I don't want to do that. This is this is a large, a large scale society, right? A large scale difference in story. And that's that's where I'm going with this. So I wanted to at least address that um, because I don't want a modern society in this. I want Earth. I want to see Earth be successful. I don't want to see us fight with people and, and kind of, do what we do every day. Star Wars is, is an escape in a way. It's always been political, but it's an escape in a way um, from our modern world. And that's the point of this. It's supposed to be an escape while including our modern world in it. So that's kind of where I'm going. Uh, and and having, you know, having the people, the Council of Earth, as I'm calling them in the story, the Council of Earth all be focused on one idea. It's honestly, in my opinion, really pretty refreshing. It's really nice to see people just kind of be like, yeah, let's, let's, let's focus on that, you know? People are probably going to, like, some people are going to be like, oh, what we like the Jedi, and, for example, in Thebes, and I might cover that in the next story, and I intend on talking about the death of the Jedi, but, but the Council of Earth is kind of meant to be, the whole point of the Council of Earth is their council of everyone on Earth, like, you get where I'm going? They're united. They don't have to, there's no countries, there's no, you know, they're all united. They don't have to war with each other, they just agree. So... People are really good at doing things when they agree, and that's kind of what I'm starting with, that's where I'm going with, that's where I'm focused on going, especially with the next episode. We'll see what happens in the next episode, I'm really excited for the next episode to come out. Um, there's probably going to be another video or two between the next episode of this series, and then it'll be capped off, and then I'll do a final video, as I normally do for series. Um, anyways though, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, may the force be with you.